welcome all welcome to the live interactive problem solving session for week 3 of the course geotechnical engineering 1 i am pro i am yogendra narayanan and i am a pmrf research scholar and our professor dn singh in the department of civil engineering iit bombay so incidentally uh professor singh is also the instructor for this course for which i am the da in nptel also i have been the uh, teaching assistant for the past two um for the past two years for the past two runs i would say so with this uh, in premise this the purpose of i would like to reiterate that this pur the purpose of this uh, problem solving session is to make the learners proficient uh, in solving the uh, questions in examinations as well as the present assignments by revising the concepts that has been covered in the particular week Uh, which is attained through solving assignment questions from the previous runs of the same courses or otherwise some questions which have been prepared by the respective teaching assistants in the from various sources or from the concepts that has been taught in the lectures so with this with this uh pretext uh, i would like to give a short revisit of the concepts which has been covered in the week in week 3 of this course so essentially the week started with the lecture on and it covered a major chunk of the lectures were covered on the soil constituents soil constituents what uh that is we know that it cons consists of soil particles or grains water air organic matter uh dissolved salts etc so which was followed by uh, the some of the uh, concepts of specific surface area and how it varies for how it affects the behavior of the soils and the uh, some aspects into the clay mineralogy different types of clay minerals and their structures and their uh, arrangements gray mineral arrangements uh, various types of bonds that exist between these minerals which governs their water absorbing capacity as well as there is water absorbing capacity as well as the uh, volumetric deformation behavior so which was followed by the various mechanisms of deformation that exists in soils the different boundary conditions that is rigid and flexible and finally the course the le the lectures to course towards the structure of soil soil grains their arrangements uh, and various types of forces that acts on the soil mass and how do these forces play a role in the uh, structure of soils and what type of structures exists for what type of soils and what are all, what is the basis for to the structure uh, basis for this for the for that particular structure to occur in these soils and it has that is essentially the particulate nature of soils and 
which also is important to understand or to uh, judge how the soil would behave under different loading conditions which we will be studying in the subsequent lectures as well as the courses so with this premise uh, let us solve some of the problems that has been given in the previous assignment as well as some new questions uh, which would help the learners getting proficient in uh, the topics covered in the corresponding week so with this uh, let us start the session that is solving the problems first question specific surface area specific surface area which is commonly denoted as ssa is defined as specific surface area ssa is defined as option a total surface area by mass option b total surface area by volume option c total surface area by thickness and option d total surface area by length let me repeat the question specific surface area ssa is defined as total surface area by mass total surface area by volume total surface area by thickness and total surface area by length so it is by graph's definition that uh, specific surface area is defined as total surface area by mass and for a deeper understanding how specific surface area is calculated for a uh, volume uh, for a for a, for an arrangement consisting of spherical grains is this is a phase of a, that is these are the grains of which of diameter d let us consider diameter d of each grain is of diameter d so for a particular phase the total area surface area would be d square and we have six faces 6d square is the total surface area so by mass would be the specific gravity of the soil solids multiplied by gamma water that is unit weight of water into volume so here the volume would be e cube the entire representative volume which we are taking so this is the expression for specific surface area for which uh, 
for containing a spherical grain assuming a spherical grain and essentially this specific surface area how it is measured is there are some of uh, sophisticated instruments uh, like uh, nitrogen absorption techniques uh, which is uh, shortly known as bet analyzers specific surface area analyzers which uh, calculate the specific surface area of any powder material by calculating the absorption of nitrogen on the surface of the grains so at this level it is sufficient to just know it is uh, it is important to understand the concept of specific surface area and the methods used to determine it and the working principle of those methods are not uh, required at this juncture of this course so with this we will go to the next question increase in ssa leads to increase in ssa leads to now the same aspects if we consider particle size particle size this is the specific surface area of consider a Each grains contribute to a surface area. Now, increase in SSA essentially means we are dividing this grain. That is, we are breaking down this grain into different type, different that is various chunks. That is various. Uh, one we are dividing one grain into several grain. So essentially, the surface exposed for the uh, reaction or uh, for a particular action to take place is increased and subsequently the crushing of this particle into several fragments results in a decrease in particle size and which in turn leads to an increase in activity so activity in case of soils uh, uh, pertains to the volumetric behavior volumetric deformation uh, that is essentially the swell shrink behavior which you which will call and the moisture retaining capacity of the soils so these two are the aspects uh, which come under the activity hence a uh, increase in specific surface area uh, leads to a reduction in particle size which we saw and increase in activity hence this the option d is right one of the best examples of this aspect i would say is uh, mont marlonite whose specific surface area is almost 800 meter cube meter square per gram and we know that mont marlonite is extremely uh, prone to or sus susceptible to volumetric deformation behavior this will answer and you will study you will also study how uh, how we confirm that it's uh, relatively their moisture retaining capacity is higher in the subsequent lectures
So let us move to the third question. Which of the following instruments can be used for elemental analysis of soils? So here, elemental analysis of soils. Uh, now let us it can the notion of this statement is it's a comprehensive study of the composition, how they are present, uh, their arrangement, etc. For a comprehensive elemental analysis. So the first option is extract X-ray diffractometer. X-ray diffractometer is essentially used to study the minerals present in it. Minerals means, as we saw earlier, for example, rock minerals, uh, quartz, kaolinite, monolinite, calcite. Etc. And the nature of these minerals, whether they are present in crystalline forms or amorphous form. So crystalline form, as we as uh, it has been shown in the lecture, crystalline form would uh, depict a peak, frequent peak in the uh, response graph, whereas amorphous would be a uh, plateau. So essentially, it is entirely uh, used to analyze the minerals and the nature of minerals that is present, whether it is crystalline or amorphous. Now, coming to scanning electron microscope. So, scanning electron microscope is usually to understand the arrangement of the grains, how they are arranged. Uh, what to see whether there is a grain to grain contact or they are arranged there is a um, that is essentially which surface phenomena which we commonly known uh, commonly call as texture or topography of the uh, soil samples which is under study and scanning electron microscope Combined with uh, electron dispersive spectroscopy provides the elements present in the soils, uh, which would uh, uh, comprise of, for example, if it com com comprises of uh, uh, silica, uh, calcium, magnesium. Etc. So, scanning electron microscope does that job uh, in combination with EDS. We can understand both the elements present in it as well as the uh, arrangement of it. And finally, X ray fluorescence spectrometer, which is known as X ray diffractometer, is known as XRD and is commonly known as SCM with EDS. This is XR. So XRF also specifies the elements present in it. For example, for iron, uh, calcium, uh, potassium, um, magnesium, etc the elements present in. Uh, hence, as per the question, which is, uh, which is used for elemental analysis of soil, which of the following techniques can be used for elemental analysis of soil? As far as the discussion is concerned, all of the above will fall into that category. Now, 
coming to the next question xrd that is x ray diffractometer works on the principle of beer lambert's law de broglie's principle bracks law none of the above let me repeat the question xrd works on the principle of beer lambert's law de broglie's principle bracks law and none of the above so as we uh, have studied in our basic plus 2 physics beer lambert's law in chemistry uh, beer lambert's law usually relates the concentration of a particular solution to the absorbance of the light it is absorbance of concentration so uh, no need to remember but to get a give a brief idea absorbance of a particular solution is directly proportional to the concentration where epsilon is the molar absorbity epsilon is the molar absorbity and b is the length sorry b is the path of light and absorbance molar absorbity absorbity and length of light and de broglie principle essentially states that every matter possesses a wave nature associated with it Uh, which has been given by the equation m v is equal to n h by two pi. It relates the mass phenomena and as well as the wave wave phenomena of the of the matter. So now coming to the Bragg's law, it uh, depends on the response of light or any electromagnetic radiation not light i would say electromagnetic radiation to the response of the electromagnetic radiation to a crystalline structure so when a crystalline uh, object or a matter is placed uh, the interatomic distance or inter uh mineral distance of d and light falling on this plane at an incident angle of theta bracks la essentially and the wavelength of the wave of the electromagnetic radiation is lambda essentially bragg's law relates the wavelength of the wave to the inter inter interatomic or inter uh, inter crystal distance so which is related by n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta now lambda is unknown you see lambda is known n is known whereas uh, there by the way n is the order of diffraction and theta is known from which we will be obtaining d and this d uh, based on the database available in the uh, public domain 
will be related and the corresponding mineral will be uh, correlated with the value of d so essentially xrd works on the principle of this bragg's law where lambda is the wavelength of the x rays theta is the incident angle of this uh, using x rays and uh, d is the uh, interatomic distance or inter intermineral distance that is within the crystal or within the mineral so hence xrd the right correct option for this question is bragg's law so moving to the next question without the following deformation mechanism is negligible in case of soils with rigid boundaries because of the following deformation mechanism is negligible in case of soils with rigid boundaries so option a bending option d rolling option c crushing option d none of the above option a bending option b rolling option c crushing option d none of the above so as we are as um, i start in the lecture which i would like to reiterate in this context so the deformation behavior of the soils to the external load can be studied based on two boundary conditions one where the boundaries are rigid that is they cannot be deformed it is volumetric deformation is zero it is uh, total volume remains zero uh, change volume change is zero and second one is relatively flexible condition obviously these are the solid grains and load sigma is applied sigma applied so the grain size which is able to deform in this direction the application of delta v not equal to 0 now as we all know that in between two grains there will be a thermal force as well as shear force acting on it and when this shear force uh, overcomes the friction between these two grains uh, there will be rolling occurring however in the rigid boundary conditions the possibility of this phenomena to occur is minimal because this would try to occur when the soil is allowed to deform in the lateral direction so consider here when the soil is allowed to deform in the lateral direction there will be rolling over of particle over it in order uh, in the process of rearrangement in the process of their rearrangement so which is restricted in case of rigid boundaries and the only the mechanism of this deformation is by either the grains might crush or the grains might deform 
which is essentially there defined by the grain compressibility. So hence, uh, since the question is pertained to the rigid boundaries, and uh, we also uh, revisited why uh, rolling cannot or is minimal in case of rigid boundaries, which makes us obvious that rolling is the a negligible fin mechanism in case of uh, given boundary condition. And question six, which of the following mechanisms are predominant in the granular size? Option A, cohesion. Option B, friction. Option C, both. Option D, adhesion. Option A, cohesion. Option B, friction. Option C, both. Option D, adhesion. Now, this part has been repeated in the previous week, I think week two or week two uh, problem solving session. Uh, be, that is, uh, but the uh, iterating uh, what, uh, what has been covered in the previous problem solving session. Granular soils uh, essentially are composed of grains, solid grains which are inert, which do not have any surface forces. So, and they, they obtain their resistance or their interaction between these grains would be only by grain to grain interaction this grain to grain contact which we already saw as vertical normal load and shear force so for granular soils this phenomena will be done this phenomenon will be dominant hence when this shear force overcomes the frictional force, mu is static coefficient of friction, mu would be uh, that is static coefficient of friction, the slipping mechanisms occur. So the essential mechanism for that is predominant in granular soils is friction. Moving on to the next question.
So the option will be friction. So moving to the next question. Clay particles are surrounded by. Clay particles are surrounded by. To answer this question, option A. Let me complete the question. Clay particles are surrounded by dash layer. Option A, adsorbed water. Option B, free water. Option C, double layer. Option D, none of the above. Clay particles are surrounded by dash layer. Option A, adsorbed water. Option B, free water. Option C, double layer. Option D, none of the above. So here we, we have to remember two concepts here to solve this, to understand the uh, peculiar phenomena of clay, clay, mineral and water interaction. So essentially we know that Clay particles are usually plate-like materials, plate-like grains, have, possess plate-like grains. And at the edges, they possess positive charges. And on the surface, they possess negative charge. And it has also been depicted that around the clay particle, there will be, that is, uh, the water associated with the clay particle will be of three. Three if, uh, will be divided into three different layers. One is immediately covering the clay particles, followed by the second, and Finally, the third. So the third partic uh, third layer, that is our third uh, layer, will be free from the electrostatic force of attraction or electrostatic forces, that is uh, our electric field that is created by the uh, surface charges present on clay particles. Uh, hence, we denote it as free water or gravity water, which is uh, allowed to flow through uh, flow through the pores. And second will be the double layer which will be weakly bound to the uh, double layer. It will be weakly bound to the uh, clay surface and followed by, uh, that is the close, uh, closest layer will be it's known as adsorbed layer. where the water is held uh, to the clay surface by stronger forces, either dipole attraction or hydrogen bonds based on the uh, composition of the clay mineral that is present. Uh, these two might be uh, dominant mechanism. And since the clay particle, the question is pertaining to uh, or is concentrated or is focusing on the clay part, uh, uh, which layer surrounds the clay particle, the preliminary layer will be adsorbed water. Hence, option A is right. I hope you understand. If any confusions are there, 
uh, you can you are welcome to ask or otherwise uh, you can uh, ask in the inter uh, that is in the ask a question tab in the uh, npdel interface or otherwise in the next week problem solving sessions which will be on all saturdays from 5 pm to 7 pm uh, you can ask the questions at that time also now moving to the next question vitrification involves applying which energy to the soils vitrification involves applying which energy to the soils option a mechanical energy option b chemical energy option c thermal energy option d nuclear energy so vitrification uh, is a common or most of you uh, most of the people who uh, who have come across uh, tiles ceramic tiles uh, you you could note that on the uh, packaging uh, packaging sheet they would have written vitrified tiles vitrified tiles ceramics are usually made of clays which are and they are subjected to very high temperature in order to make the water hard in order to make the clays harder and these clays are held together by thin uh, uh, by um, a little bit of moisture which don't which is still present in these uh, between the clay minerals and when these clay minerals are uh, subject uh, that is when these clay mass is subjected to very high temperatures they harden uh, which is known as vitrification so this vitrification hence is a result of imparting thermal energy to the soils so uh, here i would like to emphasize that although this question is not directly related to the course uh, the question was intended to give an idea to relate with the uh, real life uh, things which we see in our daily lives that is day to day activities so with this we'll we'll move to the next question which of the following statement statements is not correct which of the following statements is not correct first statement is water can take only compressive stresses and no shear stresses water can take only compressive stresses and no shear stresses option b pore water dissipates faster in fine grain soils option b pore water dissipates faster in fine grain soils option c organic matter imparts compressibility to the soils option c organic matter imparts 
compressibility to the soils. The moist option D, the moisture absorption capacity of clays follows the trend. Mectite greater than elite, greater than kaolinite. The moisture absorption capacity of clays follows the trend. Smithite greater than elite, greater than kaolinite. So, as far as the let us analyze these questions based on the uh, not um, analyze the question uh, with, by taking one statement at a time. Water can take only compressive stresses and no shear stresses. It is uh, this a fundamental property of water that it cannot take shear stresses. That is tau will be zero. Shear strength of water is zero, whereas it can take compressive stress. Uh, whereas Soil grains can take both shear and compressive stresses, which we already saw, which we denoted as normal stress and shear stresses. Normal force and shear force, which eventually, when divided by their cross sectional area, which eventually will give their normal stresses and shear stresses. Hence, shear, shear stress taken by water, that is, shear strength of water is zero. Hence, this statement is right. Now, pore water dissipates faster in fine grain soil. Here, we need to understand fine grain soil are classified based on the grain sizes. When the grain size for a, for a, since this, uh, so this terminology came. Uh, soils are classified based on their plastic uh, particle sizes into coarse grained and fine grained. And the particle size determining this boundary when that is when we can say soil is fine grain and when it transits from fine coarse grain to fine grain material is the benchmark size is 75 microns when the particle size is greater than 75 microns it is termed as coarse grain when it is lesser it is termed as fine grain and fine grained essential and all Fine grained also qualitatively means that the particle sizes tends to reduce and are very minimal, which in turn reveal that their pore sizes are extremely less and their pores are very small. Hence, compared with the coarse grained materials, Fine grain materials provide more resistance for the permeation of water through them, which we, we will be studying in the subsequent weeks. Uh, the properties will be introduced as hydraulic conductivity of soils. Uh, but as far as this discussion is concerned, we'll stick to that. It is sufficient to re sufficient to relate that lesser the particle size, lesser will be the pore, lesser will be the size of the pores, and the total volume of the pores, and hence the resistance offered to the flow of water by these types of soils, by these categories of soils, will be higher. 
since resistance is higher the dissipation of this pore water will be very low compared to the coarse grain material and this statement by default is in comparison with the coarse grain material hence this statement is wrong and coming to the third option organic matter imparts compressibility to the soil the presence of organic matter results in two conditions one is enhanced water retention capacity of the soil which might lead to uh, swelling or which may lead to volumetric expansion and decomposition of the same that is the organic matter will contribute to increase in pores and volumetric compression so as this statement suggests organic matter imparts compressibility to the soil compressibility is essentially the property by which a material how easily the material undergoes volumetric deformation so as we see that the presence of organic matter enhances the water retention capacity which might lead to a volumetric expansion and on the other hand the decomposition of the same that is the organic matter would result in the compression of the soil that is volumetric reduction volume volume reduction in the soil mass hence the presence of organic matter definitely contributes to the and imparts the uh, compressibility to the soil this statement is right the moisture adsorption absorption capacity of clays follows the trend metite greater than elite greater than kaolinite smectite to is falls under the category of montmorillonite kaolinite or elite as you know they are uh, distinct uh, clay minerals here the main culprit playing a role in moisture absorption capacity is as we know this this is surface area and as we all know the comparatively the mount molonite specific surface area is 800 meter square per gram kaolinite is at more approximately 10 uh, 10 to 50 meter per meter square maximum 50 meter square per gram the light is approximately 100 to 120 meter square per, per gram it is a, a rougher estimate not exact and more the specific surface area more the moisture absorption capacity hence this statement is also now as we, since the obvious uh, question which is not correct option b is not correct now so moving on to the next question which of the following is not a deformation mechanism of soils option a particle crushing option b particle bending option c particle rolling option d particle slipping let me repeat the question which of the following is not a mechanism of deformation in of soils option a particle crushing 
ऑप्शन बी पार्टिकल बेंडिंग ऑप्शन सी पार्टिकल रोलिंग ऑप्शन डी पार्टिकल स्लिपिंग Now, as we all know, as we also solved the previous question, previous question, crushing is a phenomena, bending is a phenomena, which are abundant in, which are dominant in rigid boundaries. And rolling which is dominant in flexible boundaries. Here there might be a question arising that uh, slipping also might be similar to rolling. Here slipping is a condition where there is a when the uh, shear stresses overcomes the friction and uh, frictions momentarily. There is a momentary slippage, whereas rolling is continuous slippage, which results in a uh, and which in turn results in continuous deformation, which is which we have seen in the flexible boundary conditions. And this part, this option is. Not the mechanism of deformation in solids.
So sorry for that slight inconvenience. Um, so which of the following statements is correct? The next question, question number 11. Which of the following states, statements is correct? Bacteria preferably attach to the face of clay particles. Option A, bacteria preferably attach to the face of the clay particles. Option B, isomorphous substitution is the capacity to attract cations from water. Isomorphous substitution is the capacity to attract cations from water. In place, cation replacement ability is greater for smaller valence ions. In place, cation replacement ability is greater for smaller valence ions. Option D. Cation concentration increases with an increase in distance from clay particle in water. Cation concentration increases with an increase in distance from clay particle in water. So this this question also contains various statements which has to be analyzed and we will do it uh, one statement by one statement and another. Now, first of all, bacteria preferably attached to the face of the clay particles. So as we all know, clays are platy, platy structures. Where this is known as a face, these are the edges, they are negative charges and positive charges, respectively. And bacteria are essentially negatively charged organisms, their net charge is negative. And the net charge in clay minerals are also negative, but their edges are positive structures. Hence, if at all the microorganisms that is X bacteria are present, they will be present at the edges and not faces. Hence, this option is not right now coming back coming to the second statement isomorphous substitution is the capacity to attract cations from water so what is isomorphic substitution to understand that isomorphous substitution is the replacement of a lower valence cation Replacement of a higher valence cation by a lower valence cation. For example, in a mineral, a clay mineral composed of silica whose valence is plus 4. Here, if, uh, if silica plus 4 is kicked out of its position by an ion of uh, of approximately equal sizes and having greater and having uh, 
lesser valency lesser positive uh, that is the positive charge is lesser magnesium for example aluminium by sodium or calcium and uh, calcium by magnesium for example this activity when one sio4 si plus 4 is replaced by mg plus 2 there is a deficient of two positive ions which makes the net charge as negative now when more net more negative charges are present due to isomorphic substitution their capacity to attract cations from water that is dissolved salts for example uh either calcium or iron or whatever the ions that may be present in the water since they have a negative charge they their capacity to attract the cations will be higher hence isomorphous substitution it's not directly the capacity to attract cations but it is in sort responsible for the increased or enhanced cation attraction uh, towards the clay mineral hence this statement is right and third statement in clay cation replacement ability is greater for smaller valence ion now if we consider Al plus three, Na plus two, and plus one charge K plus, for example, if we consider these three conditions, cation replacement ability is greater for smaller valence ions. it is uh it is well known that the cation exchange capacity uh directly depends on the valency of the cations hence smaller valence ion would have lesser cation exchange capacity compared to the ions with greater 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 valency and this this statement is wrong and finally the cation concentration increases with an increase in distance from clay clay, clay particle in water now if we consider again a clay mineral there is a negative charge there is an electric potential the electric potential let us denote as phi for example potential functions are phi uh now the electric potential tends to decrease with distance as we all know and eventually attains zero and that is the where it attains zero the water present beyond that will be free water now when the potential is higher the tendency to attract the cations is more hence near the surface of the clay particle the concentration of the cations will be higher this there will be a bunch of cations near the surface of the clay particle clay surface and as we move away from the surface the concentration of these cations keeps on decreasing uh, that is which is attached to the clay clay particle 
and whereas this statement uh, is um, is stating exactly the opposite of what happens. Hence, this statement is wrong. Now, eventually, as we all know, option B is the correct answer. Now, question number 12, moving on to the moving on to question number 12. The activity of soil particles depend on option A, volume, option B, density, option C, total mass, Option D, specific surface area. The activity of soil particles depends on the volume. Option B, density. Option C, total mass. Option D, specific surface area. Now, as I said before, activity is essentially the volumetric uh, tendency for volumetric deformation. When it essentially when it comes into contact with water, as well as the water retention capacity of the particular type of soil. Hence, which is essentially governed by as are comprehensively governed by specific surface area. Even though, even though total mass is a part of specific surface area, it is the area that is present that is divided by the total mass that governs the uh, activity of the soils. Option D is the right touch, right answer. So oh, moving on to the next question. The type of forces acting within the soil grains. Option A body force. Option B surface forces. Option C neither. Body force, the types of forces occurring within the soil grains. Option A, body force. Option B, surface forces. Option C, neither of the options. Oh. I uh, in the previous in the earlier one of the questions I gave a slight hint on body forces and surface forces. So body forces are essentially where the force acts on the entire the entire uh, mass or the entire weight weight is all obviously a force the entire mass of the uh, object or particles. So one of the uh, primary forces that is acting, uh, that is a body force is its self-weight and gravitational force. Obviously that is the effect of self-weight and gravitational force. And surface forces are Uh, are basically the forces that 
acts only on the surface of the particle for example one of the beautiful examples for an example of surface force is the clay particle where the charge acting on the surface charge is only acting on the surface whereas the interior of the clay minerals are relate are usually neutral and only the surface is exposed uh, surface is charged and these uh, these charges gives rise to electrostatic forces which is in in turn it is a surface force uh, one of the uh, fundamental examples of surface force so if we consider soil grains now coming back to the question if we consider soil grains soil grains more, both consists of clays as well as inert inert minerals and inert minerals when usually occur in coarse grain materials these coarse grain materials the dominant force will be body force and in clays since their particle size is very less their body force might not be dominant compared to the surface force hence here the dominant force is surface force hence since the question demand uh, the types of forces in soil grains which is a generalized terminology uh, it is prudent to consider the both the types of grains and hence both options are right now arrange the ions aluminum ion lithium ion and ammonium ammonium ion sorry for the mistake ammonium ion in the increasing order of cation exchange capacity so to understand this to first we shall assign the valency to these ions aluminum is plus 3 lithium is plus 1 ammonium is plus 1 now as we all know increase in valency increase in valency increases cation exchange capacity hence it is obvious that aluminum has greater cation exchange capacity now now an interesting uh, thing to note is the other two uh, ions possess both plus 1 and plus both charges are plus 1 now here the size of the ions comes into picture greater the size of the ion greater will be its cation exchange capacity hence usually ammonium ion size of ammonium ion is greater than lithium ion as as you know in periodic table lithium is one of the smallest ions uh, smallest uh, uh, elements because its uh, atomic number is 3 hydrogen helium lithium beryllium the lithium plus 1 and ammonia is a molecule ammonia molecule when it combines to a uh, combines with a hydrogen ion it gains a extra positive charge it results in ammonium ion formation hence this its size is greater and hence 
when the valencies are equal the ions with greater ionic size will with will have more cation exchange capacity and hence obviously nh4 plus will have greater than like this one hence option b is the right option moving on to the next question the net charge in a clay particle is the net charge in a clay particle is option a negative option b positive option c it can be either negative or positive option d neutral the net charge in a clay particle is option a negative option b positive option c either positive or negative option d no net charge now ideally speaking the formation of clays equilibrium will be attained that is the formation of clay minerals clay part clay minerals could be electrically uh, uh, under electrically equilibrium conditions But however due to the phenomena like isomorphous substitution which we have seen earlier the higher valency cations are substituted by smaller valency cations having equal sizes hence the arrangement of the ions do not get disturbed whereas the charge it, it becomes uh, pos uh, positive charge deficient which results in a negative which results in increase in negative charge and there is a in uh, inequilibrated electrical uh, it is electrically at under uh, non equilibrium condition so the net charge in a clay particle in most of the conditions will be negative and due to the breakage of ions uh, due to the breakage of uh, sorry not ions due to the breakage of the continuity of the minerals the edges of this clay particles will have positive charges but as we compare with the faces the charge of the faces the net the positive charge at the edges are relatively very minimal hence uh, the arithmetic uh, sum that is the net charge of in the clay particle is always negative which of the following grain structure Prevails in clays. Which of the following grain structure prevails in clays? Structures prevails in clays. This option might be both a single option or a multiple option question. Single grain, honeycomb. calculated and dispersed let me repeat the question which of the following grain structures prevails in clays option a single grain option b flocculated option c honeycomb option d dispersed how it is obvious that not obvious so i would say no, uh, at least from the options single grain and honeycomb structures are essentially grain to grain uh, uh, are essentially grain to grain phenomena that is the grains are uh, contact phenomena the grain to grain they are under contact and they are under friction essentially hence single grain structure is dominant in 
केस ऑफ कोर्स ग्रेन मटेरियल अनिकुम स्ट्रक्चर इज डोमिनेट इन फाइन ग्रेन बट इलेक्ट्रिकली न्यूट्रल मटेरियल दट इज सिल्स and whereas flocculated and dispersed structure gets formed due to the net electrostatic forces uh, based on attraction and repulsion and these electrostatic forces will come into picture only when clay minerals are present hence both grain structures are possible in clays but we will see what type of grain structure will prevail for clays under what conditions going to the next question what type of grain arrangements prevail in flocculated clays flocculated clays as we know that card house structure is flocculated clays as in the lectures we have seen flocculated structure is card house structure something like this here each line represents the clay clay particle and the gaps represent the voids here the uh, due to the net electrostatic forces uh, there might be contact established between edge to edge or edge to face when this are subjected to loads extremely high loads they tend to orient parallel to each other in spite of the net repulsive force this is a result of net attractive force this is a product of net repulsive force here the contact will be face to face if at all or there is a there is a tendency for a face to face contact even though uh, there will not be a contact there will be a minute separation uh, there is a tendency for a face to face contact whereas here it is obvious that there is an edge to edge contact and edge to face contact hence a flocculated place consists of edge to edge and edge to face contacts which is commonly termed as card house arrangement card house arrangement now moving on to the next question match the list one with list list one uh, depicts the different types of uh, soils and list two their corresponding structures sands obviously is a single grain structure as we saw earlier fills as i mentioned earlier it's the honeycomb structure and clays we have been discussing for the past two questions is a flocculated structure moving on to the next question is essentially a repetition clay minerals is contains flocculated structure organic matter is peat intergranular cement Granular cement may arise 
may give to honeycomb structure and primary rock minerals will be single grain structure primary rock minerals examples are quartz feldspar etc now question 20 Which of the following clay minerals match the following clay minerals with the types of bonds present in them? Elite, smectite, montmorillonite, and kaolinite. Hydrogen bond, Van der Waals bond, potassium bond. Now, to understand this, we need to understand the grain arrangement or the mineral arrangement of the. Uh, of these clay minerals so as we all know that i am not going into the atomic arrangement uh, just uh, which has been explained in the lecture you can go through the lecture we know that this is hexagonal sheet which is alumina sheet and this is silica sheet or tetrahedral sheet so let us start let us come from the bottom kaolinite is essentially a combination of essentially a com single combination of S I A L. This is an example of one to one is to one clay mineral. And similarly, these minerals are arranged. Okay. They are present like this. This is alumina. This is silica. This is alumina. This is silica. Now, these grains are held together in elite, uh, not uh, sorry, in kaolinite, by strong hydrogen bonds. Since uh, why hydrogen bonding is that there is an oxygen present here, silica, which is SiO2, and alumina consists of Al. Aluminium hydroxide (OH). Hence, hence between oxygen and hydro hydroxide, there will be a strong development of hydrogen bond, which helps the two two uh, two sheets together. That is two set uh, two minerals together. Hence, kaolinite is consisting of hydrogen bond. and as we all know it is an example of one is to one clay mineral now coming to the uh montmorillonite as we all know as i said before smectite and montmorillonite fall under the same category only difference is uh one is replaced with uh, where, uh calcium is replaced with magnesium Uh, in case of smectite and montmorillonite that is the difference otherwise these are these fall under the same category which is one is to two clay mineral which in which the alumina alum that is hexagonal sheets are sandwiched between two tetrahedral sheets in two tetrahedral sheets same similarly same real 
yes sir. so here in case of smectite and montmorillonite there will be we very weak london forces that is van der waals forces van der waals forces are also known as london forces very weak van der waals forces of attraction which uh, gets subsided or which gets weakened when water enters into it when water enters into it it gets very weakened hence that is the reason these sheets of minerals are not held together firmly and tends to expand when water is ingressed in, in between the sheets and tends to shrink when water is uh, water moves out of the sheet that is the reason why montmorillonite and smectite and these uh, minerals of this class behave in the said and and they exhibit severe activity and volumetric deformation behavior and also relatively they can accommodate more water here and subsequently they have more activity okay. and in case of illite there will be a presence of potassium ions in between this layer hence this potassium ions are relatively stronger than the london forces but weaker than the hydrogen hydrogen bonds hence the volumetric behavior volumetric volume volume change behavior of elite is in between kaolinite and montmorillonite hence elite has potassium bond and these two guys have van der waals bond or van der waals forces or london forces also known as london forces
So moving on to the next. So it is a, I think it is the first numerical question of this course. Uh, now it, uh, it is just a basic chemistry for 10 plus 2 chemistry, uh, which has been applied in the realm of soil mechanics. Uh, let us understand this question first. 100 grams of dry soil sample adsorbs 300 milligram of calcium. 100 gram of dry soil sample absorbs 300 milligram of calcium, that is calcium ions. Now, weight of the soil sample is 100 grams. And in 100 grams, calcium, absorbed, calcium ions absorb is 300 milligrams. which is the given question, given statement, problem statement. And the cation exchange capacity of the clay is, cation exchange capacity of the clay is. Now, the unit of cation exchange capacity is milli, usually it is represented by milli equivalents per 100 gram. So obviously we took 100 grams. So this is being taken care of. Now the issue is we have to con convert the given calcium ion to milli equivalent or to equivalents. So how we will calculate the equivalent? Now we know that the atomic weight of calcium is 40 grams per mole. Right. Atomic weight of calcium. Calcium's atomic number is 20 and their weight is 40. Now, what is its equivalent weight? Equivalent weight as we know, is given by atomic weight by valency. Hence, what is the atomic weight? Valency is 2, which is 20 gram per mole. Now we have 300 milligram. That means equivalent weight is 20 grams. Now if we divide the given weight by the equivalent weight, 20 grams and milligrams, which should be noted rather Otherwise, otherwise, milligrams we can convert into grams by twenty, which gives fifteen. to 10 power minus 3 equivalents. This the equivalent of 15 into 10 power minus 3 times is present in the 100 gram of soil. 
and which is obviously 10 power minus 3 can be converted into milli equivalents and the weight of the soil is 100 grams hence cation SM capacity is 15 is 15 so option a is the right option now when you when you get a different num for example if it is 200 grams then we should divide it in divide into 1 gram and then convert it into 100 gram which is essentially done by multiplying and dividing the numerator by 100 and 100 and that is multiplying by 100 and uh, based on the valency aluminum plus 3 for example aluminum's atomic number is 13 their uh, atomic weight will be 26 which will be 3 This is approximately 9. Now, if you see, as the valency increases, the denominator is getting decreased. Hence, so CEC is increasing. Now, with this also, we can confirm that with this also, we can confirm that Increase in valency increases the cation action, that is, cation action capacity increases with increase in valency. So, this is the uh, this is the session for this week. Uh, hope we could revise the concepts very well. Uh, repeatedly, some concepts uh, repeatedly which are required and it should be born in mind when further uh, as further concepts are being introduced and the, in the next week uh, the face relationships more of a mathematical basics basis for soil mechanics will be introduced hence we can expect more of a numerical session in the next week. Meanwhile, if you have any confusions, you can reach, uh, you can ask your questions in the ask, ask a question uh, tab in the NPTEL interface of the corresponding course, or uh, you can uh, ask in the next session, which will be held on Saturdays. Uh, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. every week till the course ends and finally there will be a summarizing session which we will be solving some of the uh, which is essentially to summarize the uh, summarize all the lectures hence with this we will be concluding this session thank you for your time see you next week